Today, I have something special to present, a rare victory over a Grandmaster in a game in which Game Review awarded three brilliant moves. This is one of the best games that I've ever played, and I think it has some really nice moves and nice ideas in it, even if Game Review is a little generous with some of the brilliant moves. My opponent in this game is Grandmaster Krikor Mekatarian. He's one of the best players from Brazil, and he's also the director of Chess.com Portuguese. He's a really, really nice guy, and he shared some thoughts that I'll surface as we go through the game, and he also was kind enough not to object to me recording content like this video about the game. Now, this was played in the Chess.com Chess 960 Daily Chess Championship, so this is a staff tournament. It is a daily chess game, and it is a chess 960 game. I've never managed to beat a Grandmaster over the board. I think I have like six games, and I've got two draws and four losses, but I have won some daily chess games against Grandmasters, and I have a rapid chess, chess 960 win against Grandmaster Donchenko. So something about the daily chess and chess 960 seems to work relatively well for me. So all of that said, let's dive into the game. Normally, I don't dive into opening theory anyway, but it's chess 960, so even if I wanted to, there is no opening theory to dive into. I opened the game with b3 because I figure I've got to let this bishop out at some point. I'll note that, in general, the first 10 moves of this game, until I make a significant error, actually see the advantage kind of flip-flop a bit. Um, neither of us seem to really know too much about what to do. That happens when there's no opening theory, and I think that that doesn't seem to be uncommon for Chess 960. For example, if you've been watching the World Fisher Random Championship with Hikaru and Magnus, and you've been watching Hikaru's recaps, even in the openings in his games at the highest level, there are a lot of inaccuracies in the opening that you don't see in established like Berlin positions or Nidorf positions or something like that. So Krikor and I are also seeing a lot of subtle shifts of the advantage according to Stockfish in the beginning of the game. But b3 can't be too bad, right? Knight f6 also can't be too bad, right? f4. So I go for kind of a bird setup. I noticed uh, Hikaru did that in one of his World Fisher Random Championship games, and he was like, should be okay, and then the computer really hated it, and the computer also isn't really a fan of me doing it either. If Hikaru can't get away with it, then I really can't get away with it. So c5, knight f3, b5, very space grabby on the queen side, much more ambitious than my b3. E3, E6, C4. So the computer did like this. I wasn't going to stay out of the center too long. I think that's a big mistake that you can make in chess 960. B4. I was a little surprised by that because it takes pressure off of the center, and I figured Krikor would kind of want to keep some tension, but, you know, this is also natural enough. Pawn to D4, D6, Bishop C2, Knight to D7, Knight to D2, A5. And at this point, everything is you know, mostly fine. The computer's like, eh, I don't know about these moves, but no one's made any big mistake at this point. I now make a big mistake, and I think it's the biggest mistake I make in this game. E4, and honestly, I should lose like right out of the opening for this catastrophic error. I don't know why I could, thought I could do this. Basically, I just misevaluated pawn takes d4, bishop takes d4, e5. And there's no good reason to misevaluate this because it's not like this is some crazy chess 960 move that you never see before. This is actually really thematic for like a lot of Nidors and Sicilians and other things, hedgehogs maybe. Uh, Black is just fighting for the dark squares and fighting really successfully. Krikor could have like won the game right out of the opening here. I take and I couldn't find anything better, so I go bishop f2. Now, in this position, Krikor plays the second best move. The best move was knight g4, going after my dark squared bishop. And I cannot save that bishop because if I move it, I'm getting whacked by like bishop to b6 check and my king on g1 is just smoked. So I have to allow him to take it. h3, knight takes, king takes, and now after bishop check, king g3 was the best I could find. And it's like negative two according to the engines. I haven't lost any material. I'm not getting mated but I've lost complete control over the dark squares. My king is unsafe, and this bishop is terrible. This is a really, really bad position, and I should lose pretty easily if I get here. Fortunately for me, Krikor doesn't play knight g4. He plays bishop e7. And my thought, honestly, <clears throat> when this move came in in the, in the app in Daily Chess, was Krikor is taking it easy on me. He saw knight g4, 
and he decided not to go for it so that the game wouldn't be over after like 10 moves, which would be very generous of him and would certainly sap some of my enthusiasm for this feeling like any kind of a good game at all. Um, I asked him about that, though, because we saw each other at the chess.com meetup, and I was like, why didn't you play knight g4? That just felt like it was over. And he said he just hadn't considered it. He was just kind of fixated on, I develop my bishop and I trade off your bishop, which again is the second best move in the position, uh, but it's not nearly as good as knight g4. And I think probably Krikor just didn't think that much about it because you have a lot of daily chess games going. Daily chess is one of those things where you can spend a lot of time on your moves or you can play like it's bullet chess. You get a move, you immediately respond. So daily chess sees people you know, of strong skill levels performing at widely different levels. And I think Krikor was playing, you know, without spending too much time maybe on his moves. And I'm playing a Grandmaster, so I'm going to invest a little bit more time. So I think that's a little bit of a difference in this game is I'm spending a bit more time per move because I'm more motivated by playing such a strong opponent. And Krikor has got a slate of opponents, including myself, uh, you know, who are decent, but who are all low seeds compared to him. So he's got to be a little less motivated per opponent than I am against him, I think. Sometimes I'm the top seed in a daily chess section, and I feel that. I feel like everyone's putting in maximum effort against me, you know, because I'm the top seed, and so everyone's gunning for me. If there are 10 players, I'm not getting a tenth of their focus. I'm getting more like 20% of their focus or something like that. So I think that's happening here, and Krikor is playing a little faster than me, although he does slow down and I think he he spends more time as things do get a little bit more difficult. But that was a big opportunity. So here I play h3. I, I just, the idea of knight g4 is killing me, so I stopped that cold. So bishop c5, still very good for black, but I'm at least surviving here after king h2. Now, Krikor gets really ambitious here. He plays pawn to h5, which proves to be a bit of a mistake. Now, after h5, this rook has some scope, and I think uh, Krikor is looking at knight g4 check, which isn't quite working, but it could definitely work one day, right? He's got control over the dark squares, and he could open up his rook, and I could be, you know, in some kind of mating net. So I think that h5 is really thinking about this knight g4 idea hard uh, at some future, future date. But h5 also has problems. It weakens these squares over here, and I immediately start going for those squares with my knights. Knight h4, so I'm trying to swing a knight in here. Krikor stops that. Queen e1, so now I have an idea of queen over here, and then maybe I can sack here, and then the queen comes in, and that'd be mate. That'd be amazing. I'm not expecting that, but, you know, I could at least threaten it. Also, my queen is defending the knight, which helps out in some cases because, again, knight g4 check. I do have to worry about that, and I could end up in, like, a pin here if I allowed some knight g4 check uh, that regained the material even if it didn't lead to a mating attack, that could be really bad. So I'm happy that my queen is fulfilling double duty in defending the knight and also thinking about coming to g3. So in this position, you can pause your video if you want to figure out what Stockfish thinks is the best move. Well, <laughs> neither I nor evidently Krikor considered castling queenside. It is chess 960, so... <clears throat> That is a legal move. You can do this. And um, you might think that this is maybe a bad idea because the queen side is so open, the pawns are advanced. But this position is totally locked up on the queen side. Black controls the dark squares. And now your rook is on a half open defile. This is great. And Krikor is definitely better in this position. Negative 0.5-ish according to the computer. So I'm still in the game. But castling queen side would have been outstanding. And neither of us thought about it. And Krikor instead plays king h7 which I was really happy to see. And for the first time, the computer is getting optimistic for my side of the board. After king h7, I immediately start heading for that g5 square I was talking about with the other knight. I'm loving my knights over here. Uh, and now I'm going to get to swing the knight in with a little extra tempo because I'm going to check the king on h7. Queen e7, which is a really resourceful move from Krikor and honestly the best move in the position. The computer was giving me a decent advantage, and once queen e7 hits the board, it's like, actually, no, I don't think that you have such a big advantage after all because this is a really strong move. So knight g5 checks still. King to g7. And in this position, what I really want to do is I want to double the rooks. But if I double rooks, 
Rook F2, I make a huge mistake because of Knight G4 check. The queen opens up an attack on this undefended knight right here, and after H takes, queen takes, this is coming, and I'm getting smoked, negative three according to the engine. So I anticipated this and said, well, I can't play Rook F2 and just double rooks like I want to. I have to deal with the fact that this knight is undefended. So then I thought, what if I do Rook F5? Which I do, and I really wanted the computer to give me a brilliant move for this move, but it doesn't because it's not the best move in the position. But I still think that practically it's kind of the strongest. Krikor now has two moves that lead to a substantial advantage, but they're hard to find. So first off, I think the obvious point here is you can't take the rook right away because if you do, then I have knight takes f5, royal fork, I win the queen, yay, right? So you can't take the rook right away. The rook is posted up, it's defending the knight, it's also attacking this pawn in some cases, which you'll see in some variations, and it's just getting ready to bring the other rook over, to bring the queen in, and all of my pieces are participating in a huge attack. So Krikor needs to be precise now. At this point, I'm kind of overextended, and a precise move from Krikor will show that, and an imprecise move will give me a big attack. The two precise moves were first knight g4 check, which is a knight sacrifice because after h takes g4, remember, I did defend this, so it's not so simple anymore, but h takes g4, he's threatening rook takes and then rook h8 here, so king g3, but f6, and the knight ends up trapped here on g5. So f6 is really hard to find. You have to sacrifice your knight and then play f6, and then you have to also be like, there are a lot of pieces around my king but none of them can do anything. But this is significantly advantageous for Krikor if he finds it. Fortunately for me, it's a hard line, and he doesn't find that one. The other hard line he could have found is king to g8, which is really a brilliant defensive move. And there's going to be a, light, a later <laughs> move to g8 that's another brilliant defensive move. Fortunately for me, Krikor doesn't find these two options, but they're really computery. If now I continue queen g3, which is what I think is the most natural, it's not the strongest, I, I have better moves that keep me more in the game, but I want to play this move. The problem is that after pawn takes, knight takes, it seems like I'm doing well because I'm threatening some massive discoveries and I'm attacking his queen, but again he has this knight g4 check, which he keeps coming back to, and it's always frustrating for me. If I take here, he takes here, and he's just winning. So the only move actually is to take with the queen and then take here. But I'm going to lose the exchange, and I probably will lose the game. I do have better moves after king g8 than queen g3. The computer says I need to fall back with knight f3, but of course I'm not happy about having to play a retreating move. Again, though, rook f5 is a challenging move. King g8 and knight g4 and the following variations are not easy finds, and fortunately for me, after rook f5, Krikor plays knight e8, which is not the strongest move in the position, and now I actually have a significant advantage. So after knight e8, I play queen g3. I already have threats here, because if, for example, bishop c6, just to make a kind of random but natural move, I have knight takes f7, and I'm coming in with queen takes g6 or knight takes g6 with massive discovery threats and a fork. I'm plus 10 according to the computer. So I'm already threatening big things on f7 and g6. So it's not easy to defend. Krikor finds the second best move according to the engine. Rook h6. It does look a little bit ugly to bury the rook over here, but you need defense of g6. So that's one of the best moves available to Krikor, but my attack is still very strong. Rook over to f1. I'm immediately threatening f7, and there are basically two defensive moves here that I had calculated, and they're really the only options to consider here. One is knight d6, attacking the rook with the knight and defending f7, and the other is pawn f6. Now, f6 is played in the game. I was really hoping for knight d6, because after knight d6, first off, I actually have a winning attack with rook takes f7, though there are some complicated variations there, but I found something simpler and stronger. I have c5, and I really like this move. With this big attack over on the king side where I have all of these pieces participating in the attack, I make a little pawn move on the flank, and it just overwhelms the defense. So there are basically a couple of choices here. I'm threatening this knight, which is defending f7. 
so you have to play uh, a response that is either knight takes c5 or knight takes f5. There's nothing else to do because I'll take the knight and attack your queen if you don't do one of those moves. In this position, if the knight takes on c5, I have a very pretty finish with rook takes e5. So I picked up a pawn, so that's already nice. But now I've attacked the queen and the knight, so you defend the knight, but I just take it anyway because classic tactic here, rook takes leads to finally a royal fork. Finally, I get to force a rook sacrifice into a royal fork. Very, very pretty. So after c5, because of that, you can't take with the knight, and if knight takes on f5, there's the variation. Finding it in the move list was hard. Uh, knight takes, I've got the royal fork, so you have to take here, and the 96 is double check, and the only move that doesn't allow queen g7 mate on the next turn is king f6, but I still come in, and then here is mate, and I love that the pawn on c5 that I just sent up the uh, flank over there is covering the d6 square to make this mate and not just a check where the king can keep running. So I was really hoping for knight d6 and c5. It seemed very reasonable, but Krikor does go for the other stronger defense, pawn to f6. Now in this position, I get flashy, and I'm like, yay, I'm playing brilliant moves. But actually, what I play is not the strongest. I go for a knight sacrifice with 96, which is the second best move in the position. And it did not get me the brilliant annotation like I really hoped it did. The brilliant moves, by the way, that I got earlier, not rook f5, because remember, it wasn't the strongest move in the position, but after I play rook f5 uh, and 98 is played, the computer gave me brilliant moves for queen g3, continuing to offer the rook sacrifice, and then on the next move, rook to f1, again, continuing to offer the rook sacrifice. So I thought rook f5 was pretty brilliant, but it proves not to be objectively the best. So game review doesn't give it the brilliant annotation. I think it's still really strong. I'm proud of that move. But the two moves that it does give the brilliant annotation to, queen g3 and rook hf1, aren't so impressive. The one I have coming up, though, is a little bit better. So again, backing up, f6 is played in this position. Uh, and now... I, I told you I sacrificed the knight, which we're gonna look at in a moment. That's the game continuation. The computer points out though that better was retreating the knight. And I didn't wanna do this because I'm like, my knights are tripping over each other. This knight has nowhere to go. My rooks are now doubled and disconnected. And it feels like everything is just awkward over here. The problem is I didn't anticipate that even if everything's kind of awkward for me, I'm actually just winning because um, I have a sacrifice against every move he can play, <coughs> which is hard to see. But for example, knight d6, I have rook takes h5. And if he takes me, I take here, and the pawn is pinned. If queen f7, I have knight takes e5 because I've got a pin on the, uh, on the f pawn. So I can just take on e5 and it's massively advantageous for me. Uh, if rook g8 here, I can play rook takes e5 because it's a clearance sacrifice and I have knight f5 check. Uh, all of these, you know, are really pretty moves. Also, if king h7, which was what I kind of anticipated and thought was really natural and was like, I'm overextended here, I now have knight takes g6, which is really quite a brilliant sacrifice. And then rook takes, rook takes on h5 with check. Uh, and if the rook blocks, I can trade, and knight h4 is evidently a winning attack. And if king g7, queen h4, and this is just going to basically win the queen because otherwise it's a mating attack. So again, it's hard to anticipate, but if I retreat my knight to f3, no move. <laughs> no move works. Everything allows me to sacrifice pieces for pretty, pretty wins. I didn't anticipate that. I don't think Krikor did either. So what I had actually prepared was 96 check which is forcing. I've got a fork here, so he has to take with the queen. Queen takes e6, and now game review did give the brilliant annotation to rook takes h5. To me, it really felt like 96 was like the brilliant move, and rook takes h5 was kind of the forced follow-up, but game review kind of flips it because it's like, well, 96 wasn't objectively the best. You could have retreated the knight, but now that you've sacrificed the knight, good job finding rook takes h5 because everything else sucked, but rook takes h5 is the intention. And this is still a really strong attack, and it's very hard for Krikor to defend. So 
in this position, he does play rook takes h5, which is kind of the main line, and we'll see that. A better defense. First off, like let's see what he let's see what would happen if he played kind of a, a natural move. I'm threatening here knight f5 check. And I'm also threatening if, for example, king h7, I could actually take here, but I'm just threatening to take the rook and then mate here. So that's really hard to defend against. The double threat of knight f5 check and rook takes and then queen takes g6 mate leaves him few choices. But the best choice was rook g8. And I told you there was a brilliant defensive king g8 earlier uh, that he could have played, very computery. And uh, again here, this is a brilliant defensive king uh, rook g8 uh, instead of king g8 that he could have played. So defensive moves on this square are kind of an order of the day for black. Here I have knight f5 check, but after king f8... <clears throat> I can't just so cleanly win this rook because I've got pieces hanging over here and he's got uh, attacks on my queen that he's uncovering when he takes these pieces. So it's very frustrating. The best I have is knight takes, pawn takes. I take here and in this position, queen e3 is a bit better for me and this is the best for both of us. I still have like rook d1 and the default looks juicy. I have like queen a7 and the queen side looks juicy. And the computer says I'm better, but not that much. But I think it's still really hard for him. I think I have decent chances from this position to win, although my bishop is still a big pawn, so maybe I'm being optimistic. I do love my queen and rook, though. In the game, though, after rook takes h5, he takes that rook on h5, which is definitely the most natural move. Queen takes g6 check, and I'm able to pick the rook back up with check, but I'm still down a sacrificed knight. At this point, after king g8, queen g6 check, a big question is, does Krikor have to allow a perpetual? And then a question that's going to come after that is, do I have to take a perpetual? So after queen g6, he could block with knight g7. He doesn't, and that's the right decision, because after a lot of calculation, I realized knight f5, I'm attacking here, the queen can't defend because I have knight check, and that'd be a royal fork. So rook f7, and in this position, I can go get the rook, but I don't want to trade down. The minor pieces can compete well against my rook in most cases. I play rook f3 because I want to play rook over here and I'll just take on this uh, square and I'll win. He can't play knight f8, which he'd kind of like to play because he'll block his king's ability to move to that square. So after knight f8, this would just win a whole rook because he can't move his king anywhere that defends the rook. So after rook f3, what does he do about rook g3? And the only move that seems to make sense to me is king f8. But after a lot of thought, I realized queen h6 here. Switching my pin along the file to a pin along the diagonal just wins. Because there's no way for any of these pieces to defend the knight. I'm just going to play rook g3. And then I've got queen h8, which would win the knight, continue the attack. And he can't do anything here. Just rook g3 and the idea of queen check and, and picking up the knight, well, not with the queen, but with one of the other pieces, is decisive. And the computer says plus six. So after a lot of thought, Krikor realizes I can't go for any of those lines. I can't block with a knight. So I have to move my king over to h8. And at this point, I realize, you know, I can take a perpetual, but I do turn it down. I realize I still really like my position, even if I can't finish off the attack. So after king h8, I play queen h6 check. And in this position... I find a pretty good move that's close to winning, but the computer points out an even better move that's just brilliant, so I have to show it. It's c5. I was really trying to figure out how to include this bishop in the attack. I even thought about slow stuff like this and decided it was too slow. I was like, if I get my bishop in, you know, that could be the extra piece I need to finish things off. But c5 has the idea of this. And I did kind of consider this move, but I was like, knight takes c5, and you're stopping my bishop from coming in, and I gave up a pawn for no reason. But now I can play knight g6, which is kind of the move I played in the game. And how do you defend this rook? You can't move it because I'll mate you, so you need to fall back with your knight. But now I can go bishop d3, and bishop c4 is gg -O, totally over. So c5 is a really brilliant idea to get the bishop in, and I love the idea of c5 then knight g6, and then the bishop comes in. In the game, I just went for knight g6 right away, and my bishop doesn't get to finish things off. So here, he can't move the rook because of mate, so I'm set up to capture this rook at some point, and I decided in that position where I eventually capture the rook, 
I think I can still play for a win because my queen and rook are so good, even if the bishop is bad. He plays knight g7, and now I decide, you know, I'm not checkmating anymore. It's time to go to an endgame, but here's a path to a really good one. I take here. He doesn't want to take with a knight because then f6 falls. So he takes with the king, queen h8 check. It's a skewer, so he has to block with the queen. Queen takes, and now his king is pulled further away from the center of the board, so rook d1, and I'm invading on the d file. And the computer thinks I had better continuations, but this is still plus 2.5. It's a very safe way to press for the uh, press for the win, and it's definitely a two-result position. Like, I should never lose this to Krikor, and my rook is really dominant, so it becomes very, very hard for him to actually defend and avoid losing. So in this position, he has to move his knight back because I'm getting ready for rook d8, and if his knight isn't on f8, then it's going to be a fork. So I come in with the rook still. His bishop needs to move, which it does, and now I harass the bishop until eventually I'm able to get to the a file, and I'm winning a pawn. So I'm going to have three pawns and a rook for two minor pieces, and that should be enough to ultimately win the game because I'm going to have a passed h pawn, and I should, after taking on a5, eventually be able to make a passed pawn, either by winning the b pawn or maybe by playing a3 or something like that. And it'll take time, but I think I can win. After knight d4, my bishop pulls back. Here, he should have played bishop c6, plus two-ish. I'm going to play bishop f3, still work to be done. But as I said a moment ago, I think I can win by making progress with the h-pawn and eventually making some progress on the queen side. He plays knight fe6, though, and this is a mistake because, boom, my rook comes in and I pin the bishop right here. And the move that you want to play is king f7, but then bishop h5. My sleeping bishop finally means something. It means I'm winning the bishop on e8. So you have to play king f8, but now bishop h5. And if nothing else, at this point I'm thinking, in a lot of lines I can just take this bishop on e8, and then I can go rook b8, and then I can win this pawn, and that should be pretty good. So for example, if knight g7, I would do exactly that. And, you know, knight c6, I can play here plus four according to the computer. That's like the best that's available at this point. So he actually plays knight c7, attacking my rook and defending e8, but I come over and attack the knight. It might seem like I'm winning a piece right away, but if I take here, the knight will pull back. <laughs> and if I take here, then he can take on h5. So it's not so simple yet. But in this position, he needed to play knight uh, e6. Only move, I was again going to trade and play rook b8, take down here, he goes for f5, trying for some some counterplay, which makes a lot of sense, but this loses on the spot, and I realized at this point that the game was definitely over. I take this, and if his knight takes back, I play g4. Now my bishop is defended. I'm threatening this, obviously, and if his knight moves, I can take here because he will not be able to get his minor piece back since, again, the bishop is defended. So he goes for counterplay, trying to push the e-pawn, but he's left this pawn alive. And after f6, he joked with me uh, in the messages on the game saying, whoa, where is this pawn coming from? And, you know, I replied that he had sacrificed it on the last move. In this position, none of these pieces can move without immediate loss. So that leaves him only these two pieces to move. And after e2 or the knight moves, I'm just going to play f7 and I'm just going to take on e8 on the next turn and I'm going to queen and I'm up all the material in the world. So after f6, Krikor actually resigned in this particular game. So a game that I'm super, super proud of, the brilliant moves according to the engine, uh, according to game review, were not necessarily the best moves according to me. I felt like the moves I was most proud of were rook f5 and knight e6 check, and really proud also of calculating some variations that didn't show up on the board, but that were critical to everything actually working out. So I'm really proud of the game, but game review, I don't know got it, that, that it got it right with the brilliant moves, but there were some really nice moves and ideas that I'm quite proud of. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to see more, of course, please do subscribe. And as always, a like, a comment feels great, is super appreciated, and it does help the channel grow. Thank you so much, and have a great day.